Okay. Okay, so we'll get started here, minus the jokes. Um, my name is Keith Basil. I'm the general manager for SUSE's Edge business. Uh, I've been in the space for quite a while, uh, formerly with um, another open source company, and I was the cloud uh, product security manager and worked closely with um, our DoD and IC customers and global telcos around the world securing cloud infrastructure. So what I'm about to present to you, um, this content would normally take probably 45 minutes to an hour done right. I am going to speed you through this in six or seven minutes. So hold on. And if you want more information, we have, um, there's a book we wrote on Cloud Native uh, Edge, and there's a chapter in there for Cloud Native Edge security that goes into a lot more detail. That will give you an orientation to go further. Um, so let's just get right into it since um, we don't have much time here. Number one premise here, uh, just as background and context, for us as an edge business unit, is that we expect Kubernetes to be everywhere. What that means is that we expect the Kubernetes API to be everywhere. And we see evidence of that with the crazy deployments that we see. So you've been in this room for probably quite a while. You've listened to all the various use cases from cruise ships to satellites to airplanes to whatever. This is absolutely happening in the real world. And we're using Kubernetes as an API to manage the deployment and life cycle of that infrastructure, wherever it may be, a wind turbine, satellite, or with the US Air Force, a U2 spy plane, okay? So um, what we know about itch today um, is that a lot of deployments are very, very large, uh, very complex, and we can't get deep visibility into what's happening at these remote locations. Um, the middle point combined with the second point, this, these, these two together are the most critical to understand when it comes to accelerated readiness and security. The edge is where your digital Kubernetes cloud native infrastructure, command and control meets the real world, right? So um, yes, so you have to be very careful to make sure that we secure that command and control so that we don't give um, you know, a re remote attacker or somebody uh, with a, that's a threat to us control over the physical physicality of what we're managing. And a lot of times we're pushing this infrastructure, compute and storage, to these remote locations that are very hostile. They're not data centers. There are no man traps. There are no cages. Um, they're just people walking by random gear that's strung up on the wall, right? So there's unknown threats that we have to prepare for. So um, this slide is really the main uh, situation that we have today where Classically, when you take, think about defense in depth with perimeters, with the number of deployments we have under management, um, aside from um, uh, the previous talk mentioned thousands of deployments, you know, we have the same scenario problem with our customers. Like on average, we're, we're deploying and managing five to 6,000 locations, right? So the question is, how do you get your perimeter, your defense in depth policy and software out to 5,000 or 10,000 locations? It is a ridiculously hard challenge. Right, and so typically, as you see on the on the thing here, there's a management plane, uh, and then if you're doing a downstream Kubernetes cluster, there's a cluster lead, cluster node, worker nodes, um, and we have to figure out how do we establish trust, uh, because um, if we go down into the hardware, like uh, we've seen in some of the use cases, particularly in DoD, where the hardware root of trust is established to enforce the software policy that you have in that stack, that's very difficult at scale. Um, the relaxed physical access, as I mentioned, is a problem. Thousands of clusters under management is a problem. And provisioning, we cannot do this manually. This has to be automated if we're going to attack, uh, tackle this landscape. So here's the pattern that we see globally. This is, comes from many years being close to working with DOD customers and IC customers getting um, clearance to deploy into these really um, security sensitive environments. There's one, two, and three. So the first thing we need to do is figure out which risk management framework applies to our deployment. In DOD IC, that's really easy. It's gonna be FISMA, FedRAMP, something uh, you know, that aggregates all the NIST family of security controls. That's gonna be um, what we need to work toward. The same pattern um, also works globally. So for example, if you are in France and you do a 5G telco deployment based on Kubernetes, the French government will designate that deployment as critical infrastructure, critical to the well-being of France as a nation state. Once that designation gets marked, you then have to be beholden to 
the ANSI regulation and compliance, okay, for France. So ANSI, A-N-S-S-I, by the way, it's like their, their NSA, um, GSA type organization. So you have to, you will come under additional scrutiny in terms of meeting security. So this risk management coverage, you have to understand where you play, where you're going to deploy. It could be based on industry like HIPAA for healthcare. It could be geo-based like France for in the case of 5G. It could be a combination of the two. You have to be aware, you have to identify what you're going to be beholden to. That's number one. Number two, once you um, get that assessment, uh, so sorry, this is number one, you see a lot of different framework logos up here from Australia to France to the US to industry specific with HIPAA, DSS, PCI for uh, credit cards and stuff. So there's a lot going on there and you could spend probably the next six months researching all that, okay? The second thing you need to do is once you figure out what that, as that assessment framework is, you have to do the assessment against your actual software. So in the US government, we would typically do what's called an SSP, a system security plan to document everything that our system is going to have. So this would be ports, protocols, security zones, the actual hardware, inventory, things like that. So we have basically an authoritative document that shows the entire footprint of security for our deployment. And so that's the second thing. Um, and all of these things um, are trying to get us to what's called an ATO, an authority to operate. Um, so that's where we as like contractors or, or suppliers to the government, we start to make money. And that is the critical thing. That is the only thing that matters. That's the end game. And lastly, uh, just wrapping up here, um, the third piece of that is integration with your, of your stack, whatever it may be, to a seam or a SOAR kind of um, adjacent system so that you can offload any security incidents, you can um, do security configurations, you can do reporting and auditing because it's not only valuable to get the ATO, but periodically you have to maintain it. And this set of reporting with some of the tools that you see here will allow you to easily main, uh, maintain that authority to operate or that ATO. I'm out of time um, and I wanted to just end on this because working with um, the National Security Agency and DISA, uh, these folks created the reference architecture one zero, um, the version one, actually it's more, it's, it's, it's matured ver uh, over that, but the zero trust reference architecture is a great document. It outlines seven pillars towards zero trust and you can apply policy as code to implement that into your security. So I'll stop there and, um, and, and that's what I have. I mean, like I said, this could go on for about 45 minutes to go in detail, but this is the speed version of compliance as code, accelerated readiness. Um, it is a thing, and it's the only way we can automate and provide security at scale based on these edge deployments. So thank you very much. So um, your company, is it involved at the level of when you're doing the framework of like d helping to deploy like IL-5 data centers and that part as well? Or do you kind of partner with IL-5, like an IBM who's doing the data center and then you come in with your uh, framework solution after that? Yeah, so our scope in, in addressing the framework is really limited to the software that we provide. So for example, customers ask me all the time, is your stack FedRAMP compliant or FISMA ready? Uh, the answer is always technically no, because an, an ATO is granted to the organization looking for that ATO. And in that grant will be policies and control families that speak to how you do human resources. Like how do you do background checks with people on keyboard? That has nothing to do with our software, but it has to be met in order to, for that entire um, ATO to be, to be granted. So when it comes to like the physical access and the man cages and all, all the things that are specified with physical data centers, it's, it's not in our scope to do that. We will, but if any software goes into that data center um, that has like Linux and Kubernetes, like we have a Kubernetes stick and all kinds of cool things, um, we can pre-check, this is why it's called accelerated compliance. We can accelerate checking off the boxes for all of the technical requirements for your framework.